Well, we are very pleased to have Ciprian Menelescu give our next uh, distinguished colloquium series for the Turkish Math Society. Ciprian got his PhD in 2004 from Harvard under the direction of Peter Kronheimer. Um, he has um, he has received numerous awards, including the Clay Research Fellowship, the AMS Prize. He's a fellow of the American Math Society. He has been uh, awarded the Simons Investigator Award, and he was a speaker at the ICM in 2008 in Rio, and he is currently a faculty member at Stanford University, so we are very pleased and honored to have him. Okay, uh, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, I have good memories from my visits to Turkey. Uh, is that forgot to say one important thing about me that I was his roommate in graduate school. <laughs> but, um, okay, so let me share my screen. All right, I will be talking about Havana homology and four dimensional topology. Here's the outline of the talk. I'll start with um, four dimensional topology, um, some of the things that we know and we don't know, then talk about a tool from knot theory, Havana homology, and some of its applications. And then um, the main part of the talk is about a strategy to construct an exotic four sphere. It's not yet a successful strategy. This is a major open problem if such an exotic four sphere exists, but I'll tell you what uh, people have tried. And um, yeah, and you can continue uh, their work if you'd like. Okay, so four dimensions are very special in topology. Um, it's basically considered the most difficult dimension to study um, because manifolds of dimension up to three can be studied uh, using uh, geometric methods. So every surface can be geometrized and also every three manifold can be split into pieces uh, that uh, have some geometric structure like hyperbolic or um, elliptic uh, or so on. Uh, this is um, in dimension three, this is the Thurston um, geometrization conjecture, which was proved by Perelman. And in dimensions five or greater, uh, there is enough room to keep disks apart from each other. So basically because two plus two is less than five, if you have two disks of dimension two, you can, uh, well, you have one extra dimension to split them apart. And this, um, this is the Whitney trick that lies at the heart of the classification of uh, smooth manifolds in high dimensions. So at least, the simply connected ones can be classified using surgery techniques um, back from the 60s. Dimension four, however, has neither of these advantages. And um, furthermore, it's the first dimension where you see a distinction between topological and smooth manifolds. So you can study topological four manifolds and there a lot of progress was um, made by the work of Friedman from 1982. He classified topological simply connected for manifolds. Uh, but the difficult part is understanding smooth for manifolds. Um, in particular, we're interested in what, what, uh, what's called exotic smooth structures. So an exotic smooth structure is a, um, on a given manifold X is another manifold X prime that is homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic to X. So topologically they're the same, but smoothly they're different. And there's a famous um, example about the Euclidean space Rn. So one can show that this has a unique smooth structure for N different than four up to diffeomorphism, but in dimension four, it has uncountably many. So that, that's, uh, great example of why dimension four is special. Um, you can also ask about smooth structure on the n-dimensional sphere on Sn, and they are unique in a lot of small dimensions, one, two, three, five, six, then Milner showed that they exist in dimension seven and uh, also in most higher dimensions, and they can be understood in terms of the stable homotopy groups of spheres. Um, but in dimension four, uh, this is open, so this is uh, a major open problem. It's the smooth Poincaré conjecture in dimension four, which says if a smooth four manifold is homotopy equivalent to S4, 
that is it actually diffeomorphic to S4? Is it the same smoothly? And it's known by the work of Friedman that homotopy equivalent implies homeomorphic. So there, another way of asking is, is there an exotic smooth structure on the four dimensional sphere? Um, and we don't know if this is true, like we don't even know what to expect, if we should expect it to be true or not. Um, the situation is that um, there are lots of potential counterexamples. So people can construct uh, manifolds that are homeomorphic to S4 and for which we don't know if they are diffeomorphic to S4. But what happened historically was that, um, well, some people construct such things and then other people show that at least the simplest examples are in fact diffeomorphic to S4. But then there are other examples. Um, so there was a famous family um, and at some point, um, Agbolud showed that they're actually diffeomorphic to S4, the kapel shameson spheres, but then there are other families um, and there are general, method, family, general methods of constructing such examples. And people can show that some of them are diffeomorphic, but at any time, um, yes, there, there's a supply of potential counterexamples, but somehow the easiest ones are shown to be standard. And then you look at the next ones and with a lot of more work, you show to be standard. So maybe it is true, but maybe it is not true. That's, that's where we are. Okay, so what, what, is, what do we know about smooth four manifolds? A lot of progress was made using gauge theory. Uh, this was introduced by Donaldson in 1982, this particular technique. It's to study partial differential equations involving connections and sections of bundles over the four manifold. Um, these are equations that come from physics, Yang Mills and Cyber Witten. And it's called gauge theory because um, there's the gauge group of um, automorphisms of the bundle. Um, and uh, the equations are symmetric under, um, under this kind of automorphisms of the bundle. It's an infinite dimensional symmetry group. So using this kind of partial differential equations techniques, Donaldson showed um, a famous result um, that uh, if you have a smooth, simply connected closed four manifold and uh, well on H2 on the second homology, um, you, can, you have an intersection form given by intersecting surfaces. Uh, this is a bilinear intersection form. Um, and if that is, positive or negative definite, then it's actually diagonalizable. And this is not true for topological for manifolds. So Friedman, for example, gave an example of the E8 manifold where the intersection form is E8, which is not diagonalizable over the integers. So this shows in particular that that, that manifold cannot be smooth, it's non-smoothable. And then also doing more work, that's how you also prove that um, there are these exotic smooth structures on R4, unlike in any other dimension. Um, more applications of gauge theory. Well, by counting solutions, you get invariants of smooth four manifolds, and these can distinguish between exotic smooth structures. So, the usual invariants that you learn about in a topology class, like homology groups or homotopy groups, are invariants under homotopy equivalence or homeomorphism. So to get something that distinguishes things that are homeomorphic but not smoothly the same, you need something else and you can use differential equations, which make use of derivatives, they make use of smooth structures. Using this, we can show that there are exotic smooth structures on many closed four manifolds, not just R4. For example, the K3 surface or other examples in algebraic geometry or um, CP2, the complex projective plane um, plus NCP2 bar in algebraic geometry, this means taking the blow up n times. Um, so this, this is known to have exotic smooth structures for n at least two, when you blow up at least two, at least two twice. Um, basically, you can construct them if, if the manifold is big enough, but the existence of smooth structures is unknown on some the simplest example. So on S4, that's the, um, uh, that's the um, uh, 
uh, that's the point, uh, the uh, smooth point correct conjecture, and also on the C on CP2 itself or on CP2 blown up once or on S2 times S2. Um, Oh, someone asked, okay, Boris asked, how strong are these gauge invariants? Their equivalence can imply diffeomorphism. Uh, no, um, no. So to show that things are diffeomorphic, you, you have to actually um, construct the diffeomorphism explicitly, um, but they can only obstruct um, that when things are non-diffeomorphic. Okay, some other problems apart from four manifolds, you can also study surfaces in four manifolds. In particular, you can study surfaces in the simplest four manifold in B4. And this leads to the following problem. If you have a knot in S3, you can think of S3 as the, um, as the boundary of B4. So I can draw maybe a picture. You have your knot here and you look at a surface inside the ball, the knot lives inside a three-dimensional sphere inside S3, and you can ask what is the minimal genus of such a surface. Uh, in particular, you might have knots where, that bound the disk in, uh, in the four ball. These are called slice. Here's an example. If you look at, um, at the boundary of this, the black boundary of this disk, uh, well, um, this bounds a disk, namely the disk in the picture. Now the disk has self-intersections in dimension uh, three, but uh, we can have we can give it its co this color. So you can think of the color as the fourth dimension. And once you give it a fourth dimension, then it doesn't intersect itself because the intersections have different colors. So it bounds a disk. So most knots do not bound disks even in four dimensions, uh, but some do. And there's also the notion of topologically slice, which is different. Uh, if you bound a disk, uh, but not smoothly, just a topologically embedded disk with a nice neighborhood. So some, not, some knots don't bound such disks either. Some bound topological disks, but not smooth, and some bound smooth disks as well. Um, and in fact, this is a difficult problem to figure out, uh, let's say which knots are slice or determine or even more determining the minimum genus of a, knot, a slice genus of a knot. There's no known general algorithm for doing this. Um, however, using gauge theory, you, it some, you sometimes helps. So what, um, I mean, to get a, um, 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 to get, the, I mean, you can construct surfaces of a certain genus or a slice surface in some cases, but then you also want to say that the, gene, the slice genus cannot be uh, smaller than that to get lower bounds. And that's where uh, gauge theory helps. So for example, Kronheimer and Rufka proved um, the Milner conjecture, which was about what's the slice genus of the torus knot. Here's a torus knot. A torus knot is something that lives on a torus. I mean, uh, this would be the torus. And it wraps P times in one direction, Q times in the other direction. And there was a conjectured formula. And they, using gauge theory, they proved that this is actually the, the best possible surface. I mean, there wasn't, people knew how to construct a surface with that slice genus and using, um, with this genus and using gauge theory, they showed that it cannot be any smaller than that. Okay, so this was a short introduction to four manifolds. Maybe I should first stop if there are any questions. If not, I'll keep going. So now I wanna talk about this tool from knot theory, uh, Havana homology. So this is something you associate to uh, every link in, uh, in three dimensions in S3, so every collection of knot, you, um, you can associate some um, bi-graded vector space or a billion group, um, KHIJ. Then um, the construction is quite elementary. It doesn't involve PDEs like in gauge theory, 
what you do is you, you start with a diagram of your link. This is a link um, and you resolve it at all the crossings. So you take, um, there are two ways of resolving it at each crossing, either horizontally or vertically. Let's say here, vertically, here horizontal, and you make a cube of complete resolutions of the diagram. Now at each um, point, you have a bunch of circles. To each circle, you associate a two-dimensional vector space B, and then you tensor them all together at each point. So here we go. Um, you had two circles, you get V tensor V, here you get V. Uh, the bra braces one means some shift in grading. These have some gradings, I won't talk about that. And you make a complex, a chain complex out of this. Basically you introduce a differential, um, a map from maps from V squared to V and vice versa. And these maps have some algebraic formula. Um, there's a multiplication and the co-multiplication uh, on this two-dimensional vector space. From here, you, can you have to add some signs. You show that you get a chain complex and the homology of the resulting complex, you can show that it's an invariant of the knot. It doesn't depend on, um, on the diagram. So this is called Hovano homology. Oops. Okay, so this can be constructed um, combinatorially and it's closely, it is closely related to representation theory. There's a whole field called categorification that's been built um, around these ideas. It's, um, it's a refinement of the Jones polynomial in the sense that if you take the alternating sum of the dimensions of uh, Havana homology, uh, and you keep track of one grading by a power of Q, you get the Jones polynomial of the knot, a famous knot polynomial. Um, what's relevant for four dimensions is that it has something to do with surfaces in the cylinder, in this four dimensional cylinder S3 times zero one. If you have some cobordism from one knot to another or from one link to another, then you get a map induced on Hovano homology. So you, the surface induces a map from Hovano of K0 to Hovanov of K1, and they compose nicely, like it's this is factorial. Um, okay, so uh, starting from here, you can get some four dimensional applications um, that are related to knots. So in particular, it, uh, about a problem that I mentioned before, like what is the slice genus of a knot? So um, using a deformation of Havana homology, Rasmussen, someone else that is, is at an I know from grad school. Um, so he extracted a numerical knot invariant uh, that's called S. Um, and this gives a lower bound for the slice genus. Uh, the slice genus was the minimal genus of a surface in four dimensions with boundary the knot. Um, and using this, he managed to prove to give another proof of the Milner conjecture, the one that was originally proved by Kronhammer and Rovka using gauge theory. Uh, basically, he computed the S invariant of torus knots, and this gave him the right bound, and it, it gives another way of computing um, GS of TPQ. Um, and basically, this gives hope that um, Havana homology can act as a replacement in, to some extent for gauge theory. Indeed, you can use it to prove the existence of exotic smooth structures on R4 by basically finding a topologically sliced knot where S is non-zero. So you can compute S by computer. There are ways to construct topologically sliced knots. And if S is non-zero, then it's not sliced. And Starting from just this distinction about topological versus smooth for surfaces, there's a way that that's kind of known by, by the experts to construct an exotic smooth structure on R4. I won't get into the details. Uh, it's, so Havana homology is a partial replacement of gauge theory. It's not a complete replacement. For example, the Donaldson diagonalizability theorem or other results strictly about four manifolds do not have proofs about based on of one of homology.
Um, okay, if you want to get more um, applications and extend it to uh, four manifolds, well, you would like it to first extend it to nodes in other three manifolds. Um, and there have been such extensions. Um, there are some elementary extensions um, that are similar in flavor to its original definition. And this work for some specific three manifolds like S1 times S2 or connected sums of S1 times S2 or RP3, the three-dimensional real projective space. And you can also extend the Rasmussen invariant to some of these settings. So I did some work with Marin Gonshar, Carr, and Willis for n copies of S1 times S2 and with Willis for RP3. And you can prove um, minimal genus bounds for surfaces in some four manifolds. In some four manifolds with boundary, um, this kind of three manifolds, for example, S1 times B3 or B2 times S2, then the boundary of these two things is S1 times S2. And you can look at knots inside there and ask what kind of, um, uh, I mean, what's the minimal genus that they can bound. Similarly, in RP3 times 0, 1, if you put the boundary on one side of this, uh, so this is a cylinder and you put the knot on one side of the boundary. Here's a sample application of this kind of um, results uh, that I proved with Willis. You can show that there exist knots uh, K1 and K2 in RP3 that are not concordant. So concordant means that they bound some annulus from one to the other inside the cylinder, inside RP3 times 0, 1 in this case. So they are not concordant, but when you lift it to S3, so RP3 is S3 modern involution, mod the identifying the opposite um, points in S3. So when you leave them to S3, they become concordant. They co-bound an annulus. So this is one thing you can prove using the generalization of the Rasmussen invariant to RP3. Um, here's an exciting new application from uh, five years ago already. Um, this is still about knots in S3. Um, there was, so people managed to figure out which knots with up to 12 crossings are sliced. Uh, but there was one exception that stayed on for many years, the Conway knot. Um, it's some 11 crossing knot shown here. Uh, this is topologically sliced. So it bounds topological, nice disc. Um, and whatever people, whatever obstructions people know to sliceness were all zero, including the Rasmussen invariant. It was zero, so people didn't know if it was slice or not. I mean, if S is non-zero, then it's not slice because S is a lower bound for the slice genus. So Picirillo showed that the Conway knot is not slice uh, using S, but in an indirect way. So how does it work? Let me first introduce to manifolds that we're gonna see again. So there's the knot trace. Um, this is some four manifold, four dimensional manifold that you construct from a knot. You look at the knot on the boundary of B4, and then you attach this handle. You make it um, into this kind of um, dumbbell. Um, basically you attach a disc, uh, with boundary the knot, and then you attach a neighborhood of the disk, and then you smooth to make it a manifold. You smooth the corners. Okay, so this is a four dimensional manifold with boundary. The boundary is called um, zero surgery on K. This is denoted S30K. This is a three manifold obtained from a knot. It can be obtained more directly by surgery. You look at S3, the knot lives in there, you take out a neighborhood and then a neighborhood of a knot is a solid torus, and then you put back in the solid torus. Um, and you have to put it so that you reverse the meridian and the longitude, you put it back in with a twist. Okay, so from every knot, you can construct this zero surgery, which is a three dimensional manifold, and you can construct a trace, which is a four dimensional manifold whose boundary is the zero surgery. Okay, so there is a, uh, a lemma that's not too hard to prove that a knot is slice, so it bounds a disc if and only if the trace embeds in the four-dimensional ball. Um, so you can characterize 
sliceness in terms of the trace, in terms of xk. So Picirillo showed that the Conway knot is not sliced by constructing some partner knot C prime that has the same trace. So there's, I mean, she has some method of constructing knots with the same trace. And um, yeah, once you have a pair of such knots, in view of this lemma, if one of them is sliced, then the other one is sliced and vice versa, because sliceness is in terms of the trace. So then she plugged in the other knot. The other knot is more complicated. It has many crossings, but you can plug it into a computer and you get that S is non-zero. So that means that C prime is not sliced. And then in this roundabout way, you get that the original knot you care about, the Conway knot is not sliced. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, it's a new application of a one of homology. There's no known proof with gauge theory. So in some, um, yeah, so it also gives some new applications. Now, of course, these are all about knots and the surfaces they bound. So ideally you would also want Kovano homology to say something new about four manifolds per se. Um, and you would like it to construct four manifold invariants. I just want to make an aside that there is a proposal for this. So Morrison, Walker and Vedrich, uh, they, they defined something called the skein lasagna algebra. Uh, it's an invariant of four manifolds and it's based on Hovano homology. Um, it's kind of a formal definition and it's hard to compute, but, um, but yes, maybe it can help with four dimensional topology. So far in joint work with Natal Art and also with Walker and Vedrich, we computed it for some simple examples like S4, CP2, CP2 bar, S1 times S3 and so on. Uh, but yes, an open question is whether we can develop these computations far enough to detect exotic smooth structures. In principle, it depends on the smooth structure of the four manifold as well. Okay, um, great. But that, what I wanna talk about is uh, some different direction uh, about how to use Havana homology to say something about four manifolds, namely about exotic force fields. So let's recall that there's this big, con big conjecture that, um, well, the conjecture says that there's no exotic smooth, um, smooth structure on B4, that's a smooth, oh, sorry, on S4, that's a smooth four dimensional Poincare conjecture. Um, and we're gonna try to disprove it. I mean, I don't know if it's true or false, but generally people don't have too many ideas about how to prove it, but they have ideas about how to disprove it. So let's try that. It might be uh, hopeless in case it's true, but anyway, we might as well try. So Friedman, Gumpf, Morrison and Walker proposed a strategy using the Rasmussen invariant. So what they, they suggested is to find a knot um, such that S is non-zero. So S is non-zero implies that the knot is not slice. It doesn't bound the disk. It doesn't have something of genus zero. But constructively, you want to find a knot that K, such that K bounds a smooth disk in some homotopy ball. Um, so there are methods for finding this. Uh, and if you can do that, then Z is not the or original ball. It's not the ordinary ball. The B is not B4. And then basically finding an exotic four-dimensional ball is the same as finding an exotic four-dimensional sphere because you can just add a ball to it. So the union of B4, union B4 is a, is a four-dimensional sphere. And if you do some exotic ball union B4, you can show it's an exotic four sphere. Um, okay, so the challenge is to distinguish between knots that bound a disk in a homotopy ball, but not in the ordinary ball. and Anything from gauge theory is known not to be able to de detect between these two properties. But the Rasmussen invariant, we don't know. So it might be helpful. Um, all right, so to attempt this, we want to, uh, well, we want to find a good source of homotopy balls and knots that bound disks in them, and then compute the S invariants and hope for the best. Okay, so, that's a strategy, people are working on it, but I mean, it hasn't yet been fully successful. Let me describe three results that we have about this strategy. 
Okay, the first result is about uh, what about the simplest way of constructing homotopy ball uh, of homotopy four spheres. Um, well, the most popular way, maybe. Um, it's called the Gluck twist. So the way to do it is you look at a two-dimensional sphere inside S4 embedded in a knotted way. So usual knots are S1 inside S3. Now we're going, similarly, you have many ways of embedding a two sphere, a two-dimensional sphere into, into four dimensions in knotted ways. If you do that, a neighborhood of it is an S2 times D2. So you take out this neighborhood and you glue it back using a twist. So this is some sort of surgery. The twist is given by this formula. It's a non-trivial uh, self diffeomorphism of the boundary of the neighborhood. You do basically it's the identity on the circle factor and then you do rotation on the second factor depending on the, where you are on the first factor. Um, and if you do that, so you do this kind of surgery along the neighborhood of a knot, you get something that you can prove it's homotopy equivalent to S4. It's what we call a homotopy four sphere. And it is S4 for many families of two knots, but it's not known if it's S4 in general, if it's diffeomorphic um, in general. So that's a popular way of trying to construct pot potential counterexamples, I mean, co counterexamples to uh, the Poincare conjecture in dimension four. Okay, so here is the first theorem um, that this is not what you want to do for the FGMW strategy. So uh, what we proved is that if you have a knot and it bounds a disc in some homotopy four ball obtained by a Gluck twist, then S is zero. And I mean, what you want is something that bounds a disc in a homotopy sphere, but S is non-zero and therefore it doesn't bound in the ordinary disc. But this tells you that you're not gonna be able to do this with Gluck twists. So you should look for other constructions. Um, and okay, this is kind of a negative result, but it's still interesting. I mean, one thing uh, that's interesting is that it, it tells you something about disks in non-trivial four manifolds, like, well, possibly non-trivial, like the Gluck twist obtained from B4. Um, and that's hard to do because, I don't know, Havana homology is mostly about S3 and cobordisms in S3 times 0, 1, but you can prove something about Gluck twists. The way to do it is to look actually at CP2 as the complex projective space minus a ball. And what we show is that K, if K, if a knot bounds a null homologous disk in this CP2 minus a ball, then you get an inequality on S. S is greater or equal than zero. And similarly in CP2 bar, in the same manifold with the opposite orientation, if it bounds a disk, then S is less or equal than zero. And then people knew that basically Gluck twists become trivial once you add a CP2 or once you add a CP2 bar. So Z and B4 are homotopy equivalent. We don't know if they're the same, if they're diffeomorphic, but they become diffeomorphic once you add either CP2 or CP2 bar. So, okay, so now going back to the hypothesis of the theorem, if K bounds a disk in Z, well, then it bounds a disk in Z plus CP2, just add it separately from the disk. And therefore we get that S is greater or equal than zero. And similarly, we get that S is less or equal than zero using the opposite orientation and therefore S equals zero. And therefore we're not gonna have any hope by doing Gluck twists of, um, you know, of trying this strategy. Okay, so that at least tells us we should try other things. Okay, on a more positive note, here's another theorem uh, with Marangon and Picirillo from 2020. You can ask more generally. Okay, so we're trying to probe four dimensional manifold by knots and surfaces that um, the knots bound. So it's hard to find exotic S4, but we know that there exist exact other exotic four manifolds. So can they be detected by knots? And they can. So what we showed is that there exist smooth, closed, homeomorphic four manifolds, X and X prime, 
and a knot that bounds a null homologous disk in one of them, but not in the other. So if I have any four manifold, let me just say this, if I have any four manifold X, I can take out a ball and then the boundary is S3 and I can put a knot here and then think about whether this is slice inside X, whether it bounds a disk. And well, in this case, so here are some uh, four manifolds. One is the K3 surface blown up once. Once is the connected sum of some copies of CP2 and CP2 bar. It's known that they're homeomorphic. And it was also known that they're not diffeomorphic, but you can show that they're not diffeomorphic using knots. Namely, the trefoil bounds a disk in one and not in the other. Um, okay, this is actually the proof has nothing to do with Hopanov homology. It still uses gauge theory, but it's a good, um, I mean, it's just a, an example that it's not completely crazy to try to detect exotic smooth structures using knots in four manifolds. So it works in some four manifolds. All right. Uh, okay, so now uh, the third thing, the third thing is kind of just a strategy. So it's a way of, um, we're trying to construct homotopy balls and knots that bound disks in them, but not by glock twist, by another construction. So here is a construction. Suppose we have uh, two knots and they have the same zero surgery. So recall if I have a knot, I get a three manifold called the zero surgery on it. And sometimes the knots, there are knots with the, that are different, but they have the same zero surgery. And let's suppose uh, one of them is slice. So if it bounds a disk, then you can take a neighborhood of, uh, so you can, you can basically excise the a neighborhood of that disk from, the, uh, from B4, from the four ball. And you get something whose boundary is the zero surgery. You can prove that. And now you can add the trace on the other knot. So again, for every knot, you can construct this trace X of K prime that has boundary the zero surgery. And you can glue it to the neighborhood of, um, yeah, the complement of a slice disk for one knot. And you can show that this is a homotopy sphere. Um, and furthermore, so, um, let me actually, let me see if I can uh, draw this. So what happens is I, um, is that if I have, so the trace was something like this and I'm adding a handle to K prime. And now the, if you, I mean, basically the complement looks like um, the complement of a disc for K prime. But what I'm putting instead is the complement of a disc for K. So if I can show that, um, oh yeah, and in the trace by construction, so in the trace, K prime, if I take K prime bounds a disc, namely this disc in the trace. So this gives me a homotopy sphere such that if I take out this ball I, and I put a knot K prime on it, it bounds a disc. So if I could show that K prime were, is not slice, so you can show this by using the Rasmussen invariant, maybe. So S is non-zero, then you get, a, then you contradict the smooth Poincare conjecture. Then you construct an exotic four sphere because K prime bounds the disc in this manifold in W, but it doesn't bound the disc in the ordinary B4. Okay, so what you need is, uh, is knots with the same zero surgery. You don't want them to have the same trace <coughs> because if they have the same trace, then you just kind of, I mean, uh, then, well, basically you excise a, 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 a disc for the knot and then you put back in the trace and you get the, you, it's like doing nothing. So somehow this works if you have knots with the same zero surgery, but not the same trace. Oh, sorry, yes. Oh yeah, let me remind you that knots with the same trace were used by Picurillo in her proof that the Conway knot is not sliced. So there, there are also examples of knots with the same trace, but that's not what we want here. We want the same zero surgery, but not the same trace. And there are some constructions in the literature. We, uh, due to various people, um, 
But in the end, we, we tried to find a more systematic way. So we gave a general construction of how to get all possible pairs of knots with the same zero surgery. Um, and the construction is based on some three component links called, called RBG links. So I will describe a special case of this, how to get knots with the same zero surgery. Here's an RBG link. So it's red, blue, and green. These are the three components. Uh, what you want is basically you have some knot. Um, here it's the unknot, the red knot. It can be some other knot. B and G have to be the unknot. And in fact, they have to be meridians for this uh, red thing. So basically, if you ignore the green, you want the blue to just be a small knot, a, a small circle wrapping around this, um, this red thing. And similarly, if you ignore the blue, then you can get rid of this. You can isotope this away, this twists away. And again, you get that the green is a meridian for red. So this is what I'm saying here, both blue and G can act separately as meridians for red, but they can be linked to it, with each other. Uh, and there are some other things like R has some framing on it, some number, and there's some condition between the linking number of blue and green and the framing on R but let me not get into the details. It's some three component link of this type. You can construct many such links. Once you have this, basically you get a pair of knots with the same zero surgery. And the way to do it is you slide green over red like this. So you have, the, you have a strand of green. Um, and you slide it over red and you introduce some twists depending on the framing of red. You have some number that's part of the data. You want to slide such that you kind of separate B and G from each other. And so this way you get some new knot K, uh, KG and you do the same for blue. You slide it over red and you get some knot KB and you can show that they have the same zero surgery. So this is some work I did with Picirillo a couple years ago. Here's an example. I have an RBG link. Uh, so I slide green. So, so you see the green kind of links with the blue and intersects this, um, this blue uh, disc here. Um, and I don't want it to intersect it anymore. So I'm going to slide green over red using this arrow. And what I get is some other knot like this. Uh, now I can also change, I can just isotope the picture so that, well, so that I can see the knot, the disc that green bounds, and then I can slide blue over red and I get some other knot. So these are different knots, but we show that they have the same zero surgery. So we can use them as, um, well, trying to construct um, exotic four spheres. Okay, so then you can do some computer experiments. Uh, you want to, what you want again is to find a, uh, some example where one of the knots is slice and the other is not slice. And I mean, to find that something is slice, you have to just co construct a slice disk. To find that the other is not slice, let's say kg, you want to compute s and get that it's non zero. And if you find such an example, one pair of knots like this, one slice, one knot slice, then, uh, then you found an exotic four sphere. No, we haven't found this. Uh, what we did originally in the paper with uh, Picarillo, we studied um, a large family of such knots, like 3,000 of them. Um, well, let me tell you about the results of the experiment. So, in most cases, the knots have the same S invariant. And so, if one is sliced, then we know that S is zero. So the other one would not have, I mean, if both have S equals zero, then we cannot obstruct them from being slice. Uh, but in 1% of the cases, the S invariant differs. So there's like 30 knots that are interesting. Um, now, okay, in many of them, we show that um, they're not slice maybe in different ways. But in five of these examples, one of one knot has S non zero and the other had S equal zero. And we couldn't tell if uh, this other knot was slice or not. Um, but eventually it was proved to, to not be slice. Okay, so just here's our family. So you can construct many RBG links by just um, 
kind of introducing twists. You start with one picture and then A, B, C means how many twist, uh, twists these two strands are. So maybe something like this. So you can put arbitrary number of twists and you get many, many, put them in different places. You can get many, many RPG links. Um, you get some knots, some, pe some pair of knots depending on your parameters. Uh, this are, so these are knots with the same zero surgery. You would like one of them to be sliced and the other not. Uh, these are the five knots that we looked at initially. So they looked at, they are topologically sliced. And if any of them had, um, had actually been smoothly sliced, then SPC4 would have been false. But one year later, Kai Nakamura showed that they are not sliced, so they don't help. Um, he, he basically construct, he developed uh, a new method for showing that things are not sliced, kind of building on Picurillo's method for the Conway knot, but using complex projective spaces. Uh, and what he showed is that the S invariant cannot help with this strategy using RPG links. If you look at special RPG links where the knot was the unknot. So in our family, R was always the unknot. Okay. So then what can you do? Well, you can still hope to, well, either consider other RPG links, uh, like for example, when R is the trefoil instead of the unknot and try to slide to, um, to look for this kind of pairs, one slice, one not slice. Uh, or you can stick to our family when R is the unknot, but try to use other invariants. So the Rasmussen invariant is the simplest of the invariants coming from Hovano homology and related theories, but people have developed other versions of it, like there are Steenrod squares on Hovano homology. There are also other knot homologies, so you can try that. Um, okay, so yeah, some people have started looking at other families. Again, there are no exotic four spheres yet. It's still an open problem. Um, one thing that you need to do is also find methods to showing for showing that a knot is sliced. So ways of constructing slice disks for a knot. I mean, on the one hand, you have obstructions to show that one knot is not sliced, but you want to also develop methods to show that something is sliced to exhibit a sliced disk. So remember our example of sliced knot was something that bounds some disk that uh, kind of have this, this sort of ribbon intersections that become um, non-intersecting in four dimensions. Uh, this was an example I showed before of a sliced knot. So the property is that you, have, you can do a band move, you can add a band and then it becomes the arm link. If you have that, then your knot is sliced. In fact, it's, it's ribbon and there's another famous conjecture that ribbon is the same as slice, but we know at least that ribbon implies slice. So if you find this kind of band moves that take you to the arm link, then you constructed a slice disk. And um, Nathan Dunfield and Sherry Gung and also Myself with Gukov, Halverson, and Rule, we developed computer programs looking for such bands by so either looking at all possible segments in the diagram and looking at the minimal path between them and trying all the bands. This is what Dunfield and Gang do, or by trying random longer paths. And we also try to, we also improve this to some extent with machine learning using Bayesian optimization of what twists, you know, how often you can you induce twists in the bands and when the band should stop. So anyway, we get some programs that look for such bands. They don't guarantee that the knot, uh, that uh, they find a slice disk if it exists, but in most cases, they manage to find a slice disk if it exists. So for example, we looked at our family of 3000 knots. We wanted to characterize which ones are slice. And using the computer prog program, we managed to determine the slice status and using both the computer program and obstructions of, for sliceness, we managed to determine which ones are slice and which ones are not for all but five pairs. So in all the other pairs, if one knot is sliced then the other is slice, which is disappointing, but I mean, um, you know, that's life. Um, and there are 10 remaining knots. And for those, we don't know if they're slice or not. So basically five pairs. 
In three of these pairs, we know that the knots have the same zero trace, so they cannot be used for SPC4. Uh, basically, we, know, we don't know if one is slice, if they are slice or not, but we know that if one is slice, if and only if the other is slice. And that leaves two pairs. So these are the pairs for which we don't know. Um, I mean, okay, if you're lucky and one is slice and the other is not slice, then you find an exotic force sphere. I mean, that's very unlikely at this point, but uh, it's kind of a proof of concept. We want to be able to tell for as many knots as possible whether there are slice or knots. And this is kind of the limit of our knowledge. Like around 20, 30 crossings, we find knots for which we don't know um, in this family. Um, okay, so Dunfield and Gong actually did this more systematically. So they looked at knots up to 19 crossings and they classified 99.99% of them as either slice or non-slice. So these are 350 million knots and it leaves 20,000 knots for which they don't know. Um, but um, okay, so the programs are pretty good. There are still knots for which we don't know if it's slice or not. Let me leave you with this uh, uh, source of examples that they found. So they found four knots with 17, 18 crossings. They're here uh, for which, again, they, they couldn't find a slice knot, but all the obstructions are zero. And they know that they share a zero surgery with a much larger slice knot. So, um, yeah, so if any of them are not slice, since they share a zero surgery with a slice knot, then you would find an exotic force sphere. And so this is the kind of a different kind of example from the one we looked at. We, we had examples where we knew that one knot was not slice and we wanted the other knot to be slice, but someone proved that the knots are not slice. Here, the companion is, um, is slice, so you know, in principle, if these are slice, you should expect to find the slice disk, but the computer doesn't find the slice disk. So maybe this, uh, this could be some source of hope that um, you would get exotic four spheres. But again, we don't know. So uh, this is where we are with this program. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Ceprian. Let me thank you on behalf of everybody. Um, let me maybe clap for everyone too. Um, are there any questions for Ciprian? Probably the easiest is if people unmute themselves and ask directly. Oh, maybe there's one on the chat. Let me see. Different from the S invariant, can we use Havana homology to disprove the smooth Poincare conjecture? I mean, there is this. Um, um, yeah, the, the, so there is this skin lasagna mo module, which I mentioned just briefly, that there is a four dimensional uh, invariant that you can construct out of Havana homology. And in principle, it could detect exotic smooth structure, including exotic S4, but it's very hard to compute at this point. Like we don't have any, uh, even for like K3, I mean, it's, it's just uh, not within computational range at this point. But in principle, perhaps you could. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so currently, where do you stand on smooth Poincaré conjecture? What's your, do you think? I mean, uh, we don't know if it's true or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, what can I say? Um, so maybe, I mean, this is a, a maybe a lead mask with this. So can you tell us a bit more about the other side? So to prove. Ah, to to prove. The... Yes. Um, well, I mean, in dimension three, the Poincaré conjecture was proved using geometric analysis by Perlman, right? By using the Ricci flow. So some people have tried to find some flows such that every, I don't know, something similar, but um, I don't know, the Ricci flow is not gonna work. You need, um, I know um, like 10 years ago, there was, um, there were some people who looked at um, the mean curvature flow by embedding the homotopy sphere into S5 and then looking at that. Uh, but 
yeah, I mean, I don't know of any recent work. I think it's just uh, not in any in the near future <laughs> to to find a proof like that. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Hmm. If not, let's thank Ciprian one more time for a great talk. And let me thank you for having me. Let me stop.